Hello everyone. This is Uğur Kurşuncu, a postdoctoral fellow from the AI Institute, University of South Carolina. As we have been going through a full-blown global pandemic, the implications are affecting our day-to-day -day activities as well as the systems. So the healthcare system has also been affected as it forced to the adoption of health telehealth wherever possible and whenever possible. And most of the changes uh, are here to stay, so it's permanent. In this talk, we ask the question, emerging new technologies such as artificial intelligence, is it ready for adoption in healthcare? And what are the challenges in the way? So we will give a brief introduction in this talk, explain two specific use cases specific to healthcare applications, a novel approach that we use in most of our work that is called knowledge infused learning. And we are going to conclude uh, our takeaways uh, specific to the challenges uh, in, in adoption of artificial intelligence in the healthcare domain. In March, 2020, novel coronavirus has triggered a sudden stop of our lives, including financial, business life or healthcare or edu education or many other uh, areas of our lives. So this situation led to multiple lockdowns globally in many states in the United States as well. So the population went through a rapid transition to online solutions wherever possible. So healthcare also went through a transition and telehealth has been adopted to some degree. Traditional healthcare system had already some limitations, including scarcity of healthcare professionals or time constraints. But the, during the pandemic, the system has not been able to accommodate the certain needs with significant pro disproportions between demand and supply. So, but there are some great news. For example, telehealth is being adopted much faster than usual or than, than we expected before. But the question is now, what are the challenges in the way of adopting telehealth or the new emerging technologies uh, specifically in the healthcare domain. So first of all, the trust for this type of technologies is very crucial, is very essential. So that is affecting the willingness and acceptance of clinicians and other stakeholders, for example, companies or hospitals, uh, and also financial reimbursement. It is not well understood actually how the reimbursement is, can, can work uh, for telehealth, uh, and also how the healthcare system can be reorganized in the face of this rapid transition. So uh, as we, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the increase in the telehealth usage in the healthcare domain introduced us actually some of the existing challenges or new challenges or obvious or not obvious challenge, challenges. So for example, scarcity of practitioners is still continuing uh, even though uh, the demand for this particular uh, practitioners are increasing over time. Uh, so we don't still know actually how the new emerging state-of-the-art technologies, for example, artificial intelligence, whether they are ready or not, or they are mature or not, whether they are safe or not, or as since these artificial intelligence technologies are mostly relying on vast data sets, big data sets, most of the time these data sets include the social and racial biases. And also these techniques also uh, inherently contain uh, social and racial biases in design as well. So how, how they are affecting, how they are, how they are going to affect the, uh, the, the society and the healthcare system, uh, what are the implications? So these are not well understood and these should be uh, studied further by the researchers. So first of all, the trust is an important factor in the uh, acceptance of these technologies and developing trust in a technology would depend on the accuracy or how well the system is performing uh, its task, right? So it could be, a, for example, an AI model uh, to predict a particular disease for a person, or it could be uh, the task for generating new data, for example, an image data, uh, let's say uh, very similar to the real one. So for instance, the researchers at the University of uh, Illinois Urbana Champaign uh, performed a study specific to uh, the X-ray images for chest, chest X-ray images. So they want to see if the clinicians could differentiate the 
scan generated AI generated images from the real ones. So the response rate is usually expected to be greater than 50% for the fake images to, con to be considered as good enough or the model, uh, the AI model to be considered as good enough. But there was a very high variation in the outcome of the response rate as some of the clinicians favored the fake images over the real ones and vice versa. So there was not actually a consistent uh, response rate above 50%. So that indicates uh, the, the lack of uh, 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 the, the lack of uh, accuracy or the performance of these particular models in these important domains. So we are going to examine the artificial intelligence technologies whether and, and, and ask the question of whether these technologies are ready for specific two use cases. The one is text generation for virtual mental health assistance. And the other one is a recommender system for matching patients with appropriate practitioners, such as doctors. So the first one is uh, examining the uh, machine-generated supportive task for patients with uh, suicide risk. According to CDC, before pandemic, around 45,000 people in the US and more than 800,000 pe uh, people worldwide, uh, they die by suicide each year. And even after the pandemic, uh, it actually uh, even make it, it, it made it worse because of the implications of the lockdowns and state, state home orders uh, and so on. So on the other hand, uh, the mental health professionals are scarce and they cannot actually uh, help everyone with, with, with this particular problem, specifically the uh, suicidal uh, patients. And the timeliness is very important for this part uh, for this particular cohort of people because sudden mood changes can actually trigger uh, the transition from one particular severity level of suicide risk to another, uh, increasing the suicide risk. So our goal here is uh, so state of the art natural language generation. So we critically examine this state of the art natural language generation techniques. Uh, to assess how suitable they are for a mental health domain. Uh, for example, if it were to use for a virtual health assistant uh, application. So what we do here is uh, we train a, a generative adversarial network, which is uh, one of the uh, prominent uh, AI models uh, to generate uh, textual data. And we use social media data from Reddit, specifically Suicide Watch subreddit. And the reason for that is people come to these platforms to seek support or provide support. And the data set that we use here is has um, 93,000 uh, different users and around 600,000 uh, posts. Reddit has two types of posts. The one is main post, other one is the comments and the comments are at different levels. What we observed was main posts usually show support seeking behaviors while the comments show support providing behaviors. And we want to use this data to generate support providing uh, statements. Comments contain a supportive behavior, but not all the comments are supportive. So not all the posts, not all the comments can be used as training data because some of them are uninformative. For example, uh, thank you or take care. And there are lots of them. So based on the observations that we had, we hypothesized that the higher level comments contain more informative and relevant information. So to test this hypothesis, we performed an entropy analysis over different set of comments, uh, which is first level comments, first and second, and first and second and third level comments. So we found if you take only first level comments, uh, it has high, uh, relatively higher entropy. And that means uh, the first level comments have higher amount of information in them and they are more coherent and relevant. So we decide to use only the first level comments with uh, around 70,000 posts. And then we use this data to train a generative adversarial network to generate new supportive statements uh, using around 2,038 uh, 238,000 sentences. What we observed was 
Uh, the input statements usually have a pattern of containing support and empathy in the content, and we see a similar pattern in the generated statements as well. And to be able to measure the uh, quality of the generated statements, we use different metrics. Uh, particularly, we use a quantitative approach and a qualitative approach to, to do that. For quantitative approach, we use different metrics to measure quality. And the heat map here shows a contextual semantic similarity between the generated sentences, uh, which are on the y-axis, and they are very similar to real sentences, which are on the x-axis. And the metrics here represent the similarity from uh, 0 and 1, uh, which are the shades of red. And all of the metrics indicate a generated state's quality is highly comparable to the real ones. And we used other measures using, for example, inception score or a semantic similarity technique using CME's network. And we, have, uh, we got the same results. On the other hand, another me measure that we used was a readability of the generated text uh, using the uh, gunning fog index. This measure is particularly important because it measures the content as how well it would be accepted by individuals. So usually a score of less than 12 indicates wide accessibility to an audience. We found more than 50% of the generated text can be easily read by a person with a high school education. So that also indicates uh, the readability of the generated statements are quite good. So uh, talking about the qualitative evaluation, the generated sentences were evaluated by three practicing psychiatrists. With their guidance, we created a guideline using four criteria for evaluation, and they are uh, safety, understandability, supportiveness, and empathy. So if the sentence was unsafe, meaning it is likely to increase a suicide risk, so they would mark it as unsafe. So overall, they found understandability is good at 70% rate, and the generated seven, uh, sentences were found supportive at only 26%, and they rated 4.8% uh, of sentences as unsafe. So this particular result, specifically the last one, uh, the 4.8% of the sentences are unsafe, so the number here might, might be small, but if you were to deploy this particular model in, a, uh, in an application that will be used by millions of people, so the implications of this small number, small error, or small uh, number of unsafe sentences can be very dangerous. So for that reason, uh, these particular uh, unsafe sentences should be very uh, carefully taken care of. On the other hand, the supportive uh, sentences were not actually uh, quite good, and it was found at uh, a good uh, supportiveness uh, at the 26% uh, uh, level. So what we found here is, in general, the specifically in computer science, research communities tend to rely on quantitative performance metrics, for example, accuracy without any qualitative evaluation. But this approach raises some questions about adverse implications in high impact areas in the case of deployment in the real world. For instance, in our case, quantitatively the quality was seemingly good, but psychiatrists did not find its quality satisfactory uh, in their evaluation. So this situation requires strict safety protocols for evaluating these models before deploying them in real world applications. Thanks, Ur. So uh, um, I'm Kaushik Roy. I'm going to be talking about the problem of bringing support seekers and providers together in online mental health communities. These communities are examples of them are Reddit. So during the pandemic, uh, people are moving to online uh, communities for support because of the scarcity of professional help. And studies have also revealed that they feel more comfortable confiding um, in online uh, people than actual humans in interaction, at least with regard to mental health. But the issue is that they are not able to find the right conversation to have on social media. And so the uh, medical experts that serve as moderators in these subreddits, they help them out. 
They use their uh, domain knowledge and information about the support seekers posts to match a support provider. Uh, so we want to build an AI system that plays the role of the moderator. So first, as stated, moderators use domain knowledge and they uh, therefore are able to um, find matches faster. So we use uh, data from three subreddits, opiate, cell pharma, and coronavirus. This data was collected during six months. Um, but before we move on to using real data, we perform a simulation to check if, assuming we had knowledge about the support seekers, would it actually indeed improve the efficiency of the matching process? We uh, found through simulation that it does improve it. We assume for the support seeker certain um, features about their condition and for the support provider certain features about relevance to the support seeker we're dealing with and three match simulation strategies. We found that with knowledge, the outcome is much better than without in terms of efficiency of finding a good match. So then we moved on to the real world. And in the real world, um, first we um, pass the data through some filters, domain specific filtering, because we are related to uh, events um, that, that are pertaining to mental health. And so we use uh, lexicons, keywords, and um, general purpose ontologies out there um, to perform this filtering. Next, we move on to event-specific filtering uh, because COVID has very specific events related to it, like business closures and lockdowns. And we want to analyze the effect of mental health increases with respect to these uh, events. And finally, the um, Parts of the post that uh, we need to analyze through a machine learning model needs to be in natural language form. So we use language features, emotional features, and psycholinguistic aspects from LIWC categories. All these things together now allow enough information for the model to match support seekers and providers. The model that we use is a convolutional CMEs network. Um, we modify the law slightly to bring together a support seeker and a support provider instead of a support seeker and seeker pair, for instance. Um, we see that the overlap is um, quite significant in terms of medical concepts that are being used in the conversations. And the match quality is also good as can be seen by the black and blue annotations on the illustration. Uh, but just to be sure, we perform a sanity check by checking the content overlap with medical lexicons. And we find that there is significant overlap with medical lexicons, showing that the region of overlap, uh, the people in the region of overlap are actually talking about problems related to their mental health. Next, uh, we perform a type of evaluation called natural language inference. In natural language in inference, the support provider's post is tagged with either supportive, informative, or a similar problem. It is tagged an informative problem if it is neutral to the support seeker's post. It is tagged a similar problem if it is entailed from the support seeker's post, meaning that they're talking about in the same, along the same lines. Um, it is tagged as supportive if it contradicts the support seeker's post and that manifests as suggesting corrective behavior. Here you can see some examples of that. And then lastly, we um, also use the moderators that were uh, part of the subreddits to evaluate the system as their domain experts. Uh, we form a cohort of them and ask them to evaluate the matches that the system recommends. It can be seen here that overall the match rating, uh, the confidence of the moderators in the matches was pretty high across the board. And for medical professionals, it's, it's slightly higher. So this confirms that our AI system is able to actually use medically relevant knowledge in forming these matches. Thank you, uh, Kaushik, for highlighting the need of domain exp expert knowledge uh, in matching the support seeker and support provider and formulating it as a recommender system problem. It sort of uh, highlights some, some of the uh, 
concerns that or raised uh, regarding the trust and the bias and since we are utilizing the medical knowledge in the form of lexicons some sort of trust can be uh, uh, can be put so because the information is traceable and explainable and the model is interpretable because we are able to generate explainable clusters now this actually approach uh, brings uh, uh, puts ourselves into a step towards a knowledge infused learning paradigm where we want to bring together this expert knowledge into the artificial intelligence decision making specifically in the domain of high stake decision making so far uh, you uh, you heard from uh, kaushik about the use of knowledge uh, but what exactly is the knowledge so the knowledge is uh, is any form of experience uh, in terms of uh, concepts that an a domain expert has and what we essentially do is we transform this knowledge in the form of a graph which is the representation in terms of nodes and relationships there are various forms of knowledge graphs for the general purpose like dbpedia yago and freebase which have been used in recent uh, uh, methods in the artificial intelligence since the onset of the need of the knowledge in the precise decision making of the ai systems owing to the main questions that were raised about the adoption of ai more specifically nih raised created a uh, different uh, knowledge graphs specific for the healthcare which are snomed ct umls rx norm drug bank and even our institute initiated an, uh, an ontology known as drug abuse ontology for understanding the drug abuse and its implications and various manifestations of its use in the social media communications there are uh, among the various forms of knowledge graphs that i have just uh, described uh, enumerated uh, some of the knowledge graphs uh, looks like the one which you show on the screen the opioid drug knowledge graph describes the various uh, drugs and their interrelationships which is represented in the opioid drug knowledge graph and the, another knowledge graph on the right is created from the electronic health records providing an interconnection of the disease symptoms side effects and other conditions that a clinic a, a patient might express and the clinician needs to understand adding of these expert knowledge this knowledge graphs into a data intensive systems achieves performance along with explainability and interpretability explainability is the ability to generate human comprehensive explanations in the high decision making systems so specifically healthcare interpretability is the capability that an end user will achieve by from the model by help by uh, which gives the uh, end user a capability to actually discern the internal mechanisms of a model and make it adapt to a very specific domain so for example let's say we are talking about a model being developed to predict the severity in terms of depression can that model be used to predict the severity in anxiety or suicide that's what the interpretability deals with in the knowledge incorporation there are two strategies shallow infusion and semi deep infusion though there is a third strategy as well which is deep infusion but we are keeping it out of context for now a uh, shallow infusion is all about improving the data set so the machine learning model gets a, a su sufficient context to learn better patterns and semi deep infusion is all about identifying the weight matrix that will help the data set and the knowledge be blended together into the machine learning model so that the knowledge is uh, is driven by the uh, concepts which are of importance to the end user as this process progresses some challenges are addressable by knowledge infused learning for example the abstraction which resolves ambiguity next is contextualization which resolves data sparsity and then we have the personalization which involves which resolves kind of user engagement and also pro helps provide precise response what does we mean by knowledge uh, by abstraction abstraction means suppose there are three people who are talking about three different things in a three different ways but through the abstraction we see that they are all talking about the same concepts which is depression and suicide so rather than having them generate different representations by the ai systems the now the ai system will generate similar representations and they all of them will be tagged to the same class likewise there is another concept known as contextualization which i talked about which resolves data sparsity here is what it is resolving the missing information through explainable clustering which is one of our approach which will be presented in the amia 2021 tries to address some key questions the questions are what people say to the clinicians on social media and what people hide from clinicians in the clinical settings 
with these understandings, what we are trying to find is that the suicide risk factors which people express on social media are these, and the social uh, suicide risk factors that people express in clinical settings are these. Finding a commonality, kind of intersections, and the union between these factors will help us find those factors which people hide from social media, but uh, 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 make it transparent in the clinical settings and vice versa. Another concept that knowledge infused learning brings in is the personalization. Suppose you're talking to a virtual health assistant and you're asking a question and the question gives a response which is pretty much standard which you can find through a Google search. Will not, will not actually foster engagement. Whereas a response which involves much more detailed response, uh, a response along with its adaptation to your context, maybe your prior conversation with the bot will bring in more engagement in the user. And this is what exactly the personalization is and which can be brought in through the knowledge infused learning. Abstraction, as I said before, uh, brings in the explainability as well as the contextualization, as well as will help foster personalization as well. And such uh, can be explained through this text where we say that the person is expressing a lot of different conditions and the issues that he has suffered because of his relationships. And if we consider these terms independently, the model will struggle to find the right condition of the person. However, using the knowledge graph, we can find the, con uh, the similarity, hence come up with the major condition the person is suffering from, which is obsessive compulsion. We, if you, uh, let's walk you, let me walk you through the, a simple example, the same post. I pass it through the mental health uh, classifier. We say that it's a mental health true uh, sentence, which is pretty much true. But the no is 29%, which makes me put some doubts in it. Next, another case is moving further with the prediction of the condition. And my doubt is coming out to be true. It just predicted the condition in the false manner. But how do we find how why the model predicted such a condition? It is very difficult to reason such a model. And this hurts the interpretability of the model. Moving further, we now we utilize the those cues that we identified and use them. Not only it improves the, uh, the accuracy of identifying the sentence being a mental health related sentence, it also identifies the condition clear, clearly. And this is what we call as in the interpretable learning because we are fusing the knowledge into the system. And through the correlation matrix, we can find which all the concepts in the, this sentence matches with the medical concepts in the medical knowledge graphs. Now, if we replace this concept with the, the concept of the medical knowledge graph, we achieve explainable learning. And this is what the knowledge infused learning is driving for. And we saw its significant improvement in practice, bringing the false alarm rate from 30% 2.5%, to which is approximately 92% decline in the false alarm rate compared to a system which is lexical and syntactic, mostly driven by the traditional AI algorithms. In order to achieve all these research advances through knowledge infused learning, we've developed resources which are, which are very much curated by the domain experts. One of these resources is the Reddit CSSRS dataset, which, is, which labels each and every post of the, around uh, 2000 users using Columbia suicide severity rating scales, which is a clinically authorized uh, 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 resource questionnaire to understand the severity of suicide risk. There are other resources that we have built and which, have, which we have made pub, uh, public for fostering the research in explainability and interpretability. In conclusion, I wanted to put thrust, thrust on three things. AI in practice requires reduction in bias, requires explainable, interpretable, and traceable systems. Perceived risk analysis needs to be done on the AI systems with expert in the loop. And in order to solve these three points, knowledge infused learning is a paradigm towards this these, addressing these concerns and foster adoption of AI. More specifically, it brings domain experts to the supervisor roles and the evaluator role of the system. Lastly, I want to thank all the domain experts, clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, and cognitive scientists who are involved in this research in making this these resources public and fruitful to the other NLP, machine learning, as well as health informatics communities. There are other past tutorials and talks that we have delivered, which also involve along the same line and provide more detailed examples as well as resources. We, are, we urge you to feel, uh, to feel free to check out these resources. And now with thanks, we thank you all to listening to our talk and we are open to your questions.